to start off, I will call the speakers for this program today, Dr. Barry Andy, Associate Professor from SM Ottawa. Can you allow the process? And also, I will call the next speaker, Dr. Akita Yogananti, uh, Associate Professor from Genesis and Emergency Medicine. To moderate the session, uh, we have Group Captain Dr. S.K. Deshpande, Head of the Department of Emergency Department in Command Hospital in Air Force Bangalore. And also we have a very own Dr. Ramesh Sadi Sir, Professor and HOD of General Surgery, Ram Sadasi. Thank you, sir. It 
is also a little simple product study, but it is a single center study. What they did is that they did this study for the two years. In the first year, they did with the standard workup. Like what we do in the when a trauma patient comes, they go with the ATLS protocol in the managing the patient, then going with the chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray, and the fast scan. So that is the standard workup. If any organ is needed, they will take the organ selective CT scan towards the whole body pan scan. With this, again the same thing. Mortality ratio. They have taken the odds ratio. They have taken the odds. They have taken the odds ratio here, which has come less than one. So it is more significant also. Here they have taken the injury severity score and the revised trauma score because. Injury severity score tells more about the anatomical changes and the revised trauma score tells more about the physiological changes in the trauma. So injury severity score was actually increased in WBCT to 37.5 comparing to the non-WBCT as 32 and revised trauma score decreased to 6.2 comparing to the 6.8 in the control group. So, other as concluded, it is a better approach for treating the unconscious patients. Going to the diagnostic accuracy, uh, here the study in uh, about diagnostic accuracy in the Canadian Medical Association Journal about the accuracy of single pass whole body CT for detection of injuries in patients with major blood trauma. Here, what they actually did uh, is that they have taken the uh, whole body CT scan, then they have taken the first hand report immediately. Then they have compared this first hand report with them, all the uh, discharge summaries and the official reports. With this, what they have got is the, about the five injuries, head and neck injuries. In all the things, sensitivity is a bit lower, comparing to the first report and the final report. And the specificity is always increased. So, uh, we can actually uh, rule out the two negatives here. With this, author concluded that, Positive time scan results are confusing, but negative results need subsequent confirmation. The pan scan algorithm reduces but not eliminate the risk of missed injuries. The BBCT should not replace post monitoring and clinical follow up of the patients with major trauma. Coming to the missed injuries, there is one study in the Journal of Injury in incidents and predictors of missed injuries in trauma patients in the initial heart reports of the whole body CT. What is heart reports here? In 97 College of Radiographers outlined their vision that suitably qualified radiographers should produce the definitive report at the time of radiographic examination to better inform the immediate patient management. So, with this we are compared with the official final reports. This injuries is defined as not written in the initial reports that is heart reports. 157 missed injuries were diagnosed in total 85 patients. Out of that, 71 were musculoskeletal, 15 were the abdominal injuries, 8 were the brain injuries, 3 were the thoracic injuries, and 2% were the vascular injuries. They also found that in case of missed injuries, the, they found it as higher SAP2 scoring and higher injury severity score and more frequently patients with the sedative. Coming to the incidental findings in case of pan cities. This journal in the emergency radiology highlights of clinically relevant uh, incidental findings by total body CT scanning in trauma patients results of reactive trials. What I was telling is the randomized control trials in this topic. This is the first randomized control trial in this uh, the whole one CT scan versus the standard workup. It, uh, they studied it for the two years from between 2014 to uh, 12 to 14 and they produced it in the 2016. So they divided the missed uh, incidental findings as the major findings, moderate and the minor findings. Majors like any carcinomas or the aneurysms more than 5 cm, moderate is aneurysms less than 5 cm and other injuries, minor uh, findings like any renal hemangiom, uh, hepatic hemangiomas or the renal cysts. They found that in case of total body CT scan, major findings were 20, total 23, means 4.3%, but in standard workup only 9 patients found to have the major findings, like 1.7%. Moderate come to work total 120 patients comparing to the 86, and the minor came to 172 comparing to the 129. 
So there is significance of missed injuries if you go with the standard workup. To go for the incident of finding another study is there uh, which showing the similar results. Like total WBCTs are done in 534 patients and total in incidental findings in 231 patients. They are same divided test in state of mild, moderate, severe, they are going then for the category 1, 2, 3 with the same result of 36%, 48 patients and 147. They were divided in the year group also. So, with the WBCD, we can find the more incidental finding. But, what to do with the incidental finding in case of trauma? So, if you don't follow up, again, these incidental finding is also not useful. So, better go with the follow-up of patients. Coming to the safety in case of WBCD, radiation exposure. I will not say WBCD will exposed to less radiation. I know that the radiation will be 20 millisecond more in case of WBCT than the standard workup. But I can comment how can we reduce this radiation exposure by taking this study. Whole body CT scan in polytrauma patient, effect of arm positioning in thoracic and abdominal image qualities. Okay. Here what they are they did, they are divided into three groups with a total of 50 patients in each. First group they are made the both arms above the head. Second group, both arms around the body. Third group, they have put a pillow on the chest and arms on the pillow. What this study told is, mean effective radiation doses. Actually, it is reduced in the group A, comparing to the group B and the group C. 16 in the group A with the 21 in the group B and group C. So, if you if patient is uh, stable enough to take the arms up, better do a whole city with the arms above the head. We also commented on the image noise. Image noise is na clarity here. Group A showing less noise means more clarity with the hands above the head. So, if the whole body CT scan is there, if you want to reduce the radiation dose, better keep the arms above the head. Coming to the economic evaluation, doing economic evaluation is a difficult study actually. They did this cost uh, utility analysis, pan city versus selective CT in stable young adults after blood trauma patient. Here they have taken one hypothetical cohort of 30 year male patients with a trauma and hemodynamically stable. And they have, with this cost as a done in the 2010 dollar rate, for a pan city it is $15,682 total hospital, uh, this one comparing to the selective CTs, that is 17,000. Why it is more here? If you admit a patient with a stable, hemodynamically stable young adults, okay, doing the pan CT will lead to early discharge if the pan CT is negative. Or if the injury is diagnosed, it can be shared, down triage and those the cost will reduce in that case. In case of quality, there is no much difference in the study. But in each quality year, there is a $75 per quality decrease is there. So, it is to identify and roll out the injuries promptly by doing the WBCT and the risk of radiation injury is low, not zero, but it is less. And it is a cost effective use of the resources. Coming to the last one, organizational, here we mainly in the change of treatment, time management, time in the ED, time to admission in the ED to the city scanning, ED to OT and the length of hospital stays. We tell this one with the our two standard studies. Another first one is the systematic review of the benefits and harms of the whole body CT in the early management of multi-trauma patients. Are we getting the whole picture? By Sundar Sundaran and et al. This is a systematic review study containing of eight retrospective studies and one uh, prospective study. Here the time of ED actually with the WBCT, it is reduced to half to one hour who received the WBCT. And the time of admission to injury diagnosis, it came around 12 to 23 minutes conventionally with the standard workup it was 41 to 70 minutes. Time of admission to the operative room. It is 103 to 105 minutes in WBCT, conventionally it was 120 to 132. And length of hospital stay remained the same actually. This is another study 
effect of mortality treatment and time management as a result and routine use of total body care CT in blunt high energy trauma patients. Here they have defined first the change of treatment. What is change of treatment is change in earlier hospital discharge, admission for observation, upgrade or downgrade the level of care, operating intervention or the additional diagnostic studies or interventions. These were considered as change of treatment. So as a systematic review, they have taken the three, three studies here. First study shows the prospectively evaluated that is showing 21% of the patients were discharged from the ED after the negative total body scan. Salim Etla in the study, they told that treatment was changed in 18.9%. Out of that 0.9% went directly to the operative room. Self Etla told that 38% of the patients who underwent the total body scan had unexpected findings in the thoraco abdominal region. Treatment was changed in 26% of the patients. Smith Etla, they told that uh, it is one study that compared the pre-total uh, body scan versus the post-total uh, body era. Uh, after the introduction of total body protocol, there is increase in the CT scans to 76% compared to the 47% before. The other is substantially changes in the clinical management in 2.2% also. Next they have compared is the time management. Here it is defined as a change in time interval in the primary diagnostic evaluation of trauma patients. So, running at all, they compared the time periods and it was shown that ED admission to the complete diagnosis was decreased from 70 minutes to 104 minutes. Dubar Wagner also told the same thing, admission to the city, uh, from the time of admission to the going to the city, it was 35 minutes compared to the 46 minutes in the old study. Three articles, uh, time of diagnostic work of uh, total body CT versus the conventional approach, it was 23 minutes versus the 17 minutes. And definitive management plan was taken within 47 minutes compared to the 82 minutes in the standard work up. Uh, ED to the operation room, there is a same 105 to 120 minutes. So, what we can conclude with this is, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, if you know the mechanism of injury as a CVM, and if the patient is in and ED uh, time to be reduced, this position time, go for the transit. Thank you.
So based on that, they did an analysis saying uh, how many of the how many of the CDs were designed, how many of the CDs were not designed, and which one was not designed by the AP physician or the surgeon. So based on that, we had about I mean they found out about 99 scans of the 92 patients which showed abnormalities. Of these, most of them were minor like uh, pulmonary confusions or tiny hemothoraces, and some were a little severe like uh, laceration of the spleen. Like in four patients, so there was a spleen or liver laceration of grade two or higher. Okay, and of these undesired CTs, about half of them were discharged by the EV. Okay, and only three of them of these undesired CT had to go for critical care. Okay, which come to around 0.3 percent. So. With physician judgment as the test, the negative likelihood ratio for an undesired scan having abnormal results and producing a critical action was 0.05, which is comparable to or better than that of most laboratory tests used in clinical medicine. So basically, it says that 0.3% is not a good evidence enough for you to actually push for the liberal fancy. So then what they did is during the analysis, after the analysis, they did a perspective of the surgeons involved and the perspective of the EV physicians involved. Most of the surgeons were uh, pushing, saying that the missed CT should not be missed and you have to know every injury that was there. But these EV physicians had a little different take. So what they said was, although it is acknowledged to desire to detect all injuries as soon as possible, it has to be balanced by consideration of the potential harms because of automated CT approach. And it also undervalues careful examination, serial examinations, and clinical judgment. So they, what they argued is, even if we had admitted the case and we had followed it up for four or three days, we would have done the same kind of intervention that would have necessary. I mean, that would have done even without a fancy. Next is the uh, the the uh, study which Kuri uh, had told. Immediate protein body CT scanning versus conventional imaging and selective CT scanning in patients with severe trauma. This is a reactive <coughs> trial, a randomized control <coughs> trial. Here it, uh, it it is done in patients who are unstable. And the primary outcome itself says that there is no significant difference in the mortality, whether they do a whole uh, body CT or a control uh, group. Secondary outcomes. The radiation exposure was found to be significantly increased in case of whole body CT when compared to a uh, specific or uh, conventional group. And at the time of discharge, because of serial CT scans or X-rays and other imaging modalities, they also found that it was again significantly increased in the whole body CT patients compared to the uh, CTs done in the conventional and uh, CTs done as conventional scans. Next, based on this, coming to the cost benefit analysis. I have divided into six, very similar to what we did. First is the monetary cost. Uh, in the Indian scenario, the burden of paying the bills comes from the pocket of the patients. It's not insur insurance. So eventually, it comes down to how much are you ready to spend as with respect to are you ready to uh, admit the patient and observe them and do serial examinations. And then the next thing is the burden of the burden. Uh, if not the patient, even if you go to a government setup, it's the government budget that we have to consider. <coughs> For example, in JSS, a uh, bank CT costs about 15k, uh, 15,000. But an, another image modality somewhere between 700 to 6,000. Same thing even in case of uh, government hospitals. If it's an ADAFK scheme, then it's almost zero. But if they have to shut out from their pocket, it comes to around 800, 900. So this is the monetary cost in our Indian perspective. Then coming to time and personal, the total scan takes about, from ED back to ED takes about 20 minutes in the best case scenarios. 20 minutes for the scan, 5 minutes for shifting, 5 minutes for shifting. So this uh, half an hour that the patient is outside the ED, we don't have an actual way of monitoring the patient, one. Second thing is we need personnel there to the CT rooms to give uh, IV injections, to monitor the patient there and to, uh, you know, for changing the position and stuff. So we are actually taking our resources from the ED and the radiology for a pan CT for about half an hour. If the ED is full and if, if the ED is full, then this will kind of become a significant matter. Also, it also clogs the system wherein you are not able to do other non-traumatic CTs because of this uh, matter. <coughs> Next coming to 
quantifying the burden of trauma imaging on the CT scan services at a major trauma center. This was done in South Africa. And they found out that this cost was just for the trauma victims doing CTs. It was not only for the pan CTs. This itself came out to be pretty expensive for them. So if they have to keep pushing for pan CTs, uh, so the one is the time limit is increased, so they're clogging the system for so long. And second thing is the cost also is uh, you know, uh, increased. So what they found out is uh, opportunity cost. There is resources that are consumed which cannot be used otherwise. And the total budget of the hospital, about one percent was used to just get CT scan. And they worked the CTs for about 12 hours a day. This is done over a four year period. And they found out that about 7.8% of the total working time is done only on the CT scan for trauma patients. If we push it for a whole body CT every single time a polygram case comes, then this is going to be much larger. Next, coming to radiation exposure. Uh, this was a uh, retrospective study wherein uh, they found out radiation exposure for uh, these children who were exposed to CTs in their childhood. Okay. So subsequent risk of leukemia and brain tumors. It is a retrospective cohort study. They found that there is a significant association between the estimated radiation dose provided by CT scans to red bone marrow and the brain and subsequent incidence of leukemia and brain tumors. Uh, so they had phantom models wherein they could measure the exact amount of radiation that was absorbed by the bone marrow and the uh, brain. So what they found out is cumulative ionizing radiation dose of from 2 to 3 head CTs could almost triple the risk of brain tumors and 5 to 10 head CTs could triple the risk of leukemia. Okay, next is uh, the radiation related cancer is that low doses among atomic bomb survivors. The significant risk at low doses itself was about 0.05 to 0 0.10 SP. Okay, so when you're putting a whole body CT, it is much larger than this. It's about 20 to 24. Next is, uh, this is an interesting study where they said prior CT imaging history for patients who undergo pan CT for acute traumatic injury. So most of the time when patients come for pan CTs, we only counsel them about uh, the radiation risk for that pan CT. We don't ask the history of if they've had previous CTs for the year or so. So the risk is cumulative. So the number of CTs you do, the more the risk. So this history is missed and this history, is, I mean this counseling is not done. So therefore what they found out is that as radiation risk increases with higher doses and repeated exposure, patients suffer a higher likelihood of harm, malignancy from a pan CT if there was a previous CT done in the same year. So a pan CT level was about 22 to 23, providing an unusually large uh, radiation dose to patients. Okay, and they also found out, they did an estimate that a 37 year old male has a 1 in 477 chance of cancer in his life as a direct result of receiving a pan scan alone. So prior CT history also means that the CT is not just done in the, with the hospital that they are coming, but also it could be done. Most of the time is what happens. Patient gets CT elsewhere, they come here, they get a CD and we are not able to uh, see the CD or something, so we ask them to get a CD. This is just adding to the exposure. Next is the tunnel on doom. This, most of the western literature says that this is almost been done with the CT, uh, the radiology, everything is equipped, well equipped. But in the Indian scenario, we still have these problems. Uh, it is also termed as a donut of death. Because the time involved in acquiring and processing images is more, there is delays due to transfer, there are part-time scanner operations, lack of on-site technical staff available, and issues relating to prolonged limited access to the patient while in the scanner. So most of the time there are only two people, they are not able to shift the patient, the patient is waiting to be changed position. Or sometimes what happens, like in case of government hospitals, it is outsourced. So they wait, uh, and the technicians giving, I mean the people for giving uh, CT contrasts are not available on the portal. So all these are logistic uh, issues. Then coming to adverse reactions. In the normal population, the contrast induced nephropathy is about 1% chance. But if you add a trauma uh, compromise system to that, then you increase the chances of contrast induced uh, nephropathy. So this uh, was found in one study uh, by Salu Ketal wherein he said that higher rates of blood transfusion hemoparectinium detected in CT in cases of patients with kidney trauma. 
they were associated with uh, longer uh, hospital uh, length of stay. But then there was a recent study which says that any patient who had an AKI any time in his life, eventually within the next 10 or 20 years ends up with a CKI. So we are actually pushing that over the edge. So the other way of putting it is say even if you want to wait for the creatinine and then take the call, then you're delaying it just because you want to get a fancy CT. Wherein you would have got a CT brain and whatever, you know, treatment going on for the patient, you're actually delaying the uh, uh, diagnosis. Next coming to ED dispositions. Uh, like he said, ED to admission. I mean the patient coming to the trauma center to admission, the patient coming to trauma center to CT, to OT, everything is decreased. But actually what happens is patient comes into ED, you have a you have a blanket pan CT to be done for all trauma cases. Then you're sending in a shift, for example, about two to three cases come. You're shifting all the patients to CT. Now the CT room is blocked. You know, you do your normal scans. Then these patients come back to the ED, and now you have your ED, you're seeing new patients and the old patients are back. You're waiting on those patients to get a report. Until you get a report, you can't discharge the patient. So it is not actually less, but if you actually look at it the whole, the EV uh, is actually getting found. And you're not able to dispose of the patients easily. Second thing is, like he said, uh, incidental findings. If it becomes a medical legal case, then we are bound to investigate it, <coughs> which wouldn't have been necessary otherwise. So this is a uh, topic. Okay, so there was one study which was done in elderly patients. Is there a role for CT spine scans in the initial workup of fragility fracture patients? What they found is, is as the age increases, the chance of finding incidental uh, lesions becomes more and more. And now you're, these patients are already compromised in dementia or they have, uh, you know, delirium or something. And you want to get a CT, you're already giving them sedations, you are, uh, you know, putting them into all the stress. And there is added, uh, radiation exposure. Now because you found an incidental finding, you will have to investigate it further. So is it really warranted to push these patients for uh, fancy? Okay. So this is the European Review of Medical and Hormonal Sciences. They came out with a guidelines in 2020 which said that any polytrauma case should go for full body CT. In 2022 they changed it after the you know the Bernier 2 trial came out. In this edition, they say the implication for WPCT is listed and they are altered vital signs, uh, dynamics of traumatic event, and at least two relevant damaged body regions. Only then it is advisable to get a full body CT. Otherwise, you can get CTs as per the need. Okay, so, this is my conclusion. Based on the cost benefit analysis for adding pan CT as a guideline, it needs a restraint as of now, more so in the Indian scenario. The need for pan CT or selective imaging have to be individualized. Uh, dose dependent versus time dependent CTs can be used as per the patients being stable or unstable so that you can decrease the radiation but as in when needed. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your very talk on the advantages of pan CT. Also, thank you, ma'am, for giving us a very good balance view on being a pan CD in polytrauma patients and also talking us through your life uh, experiences. I hand over to the moderators uh, for any further questions. probably to whether to go for a pan CT or not lies in the uh, presentation itself. The fact that there is there, there cannot be one correct answer. Both of them, if you've heard them with passion, they have been convincing enough, right? But the, these conclusions are important. What I think of, she has drawn conclusions very well. That you need to do to balance out a lot of factors. Uh, many of them have been enumerated here. For example, said I am from a military hospital, right? So I have got limited resources, it's a government hospital. So I've got normal cities also going on and, and trauma cities also going on. Then there are few radiologists only, in, you know, even fewer radiographers, okay? How many times uh, we have had incidences in government hospital, at least uh, those who work in government setup, I don't know, uh, they will know that there have been fatal or near fatal incidences happening in CT scan itself. 
not understanding that pan city as, as a doctor, whom is it beneficial to? Is it beneficial to the doctor or to the patient? So for me, it's very easy. Somebody comes and does, sir, eco ho gaya, iska uh, pan city ho gaya, iska e fast ho gaya, these are very easy. Okay, do this, this, this. If questions, answers are uh, uh, given to me, I'm very easy to find out what questions were. But then, where does the clinician go? Where does our training go? Where does our clinical equipment go? Especially in austere environment like uh, like India, where probably a selective CT is more relevant to us because of the cost factor and uh, involvement. Uh, involvement. How much uh, do we have this facility? Does the patient have to go somewhere else and get CT scan and then and come back? What type of CT do we have? If you want a contrast CT, a CT scan which runs, uh, say. Only uh, say in 30 seconds, it runs only from head to uh, say chest. It will it will ignore all rest of the IV contrast in rest of the body. Other CT scan which can run fast and take the spiral CT of the entire body in 30 seconds itself. So you need to benefit uh, to uh, to put into these factors also around it. Then uh, uh, radiation exposure. Say, how many of us in an entire uh, uh, cabinet sitting over have got more than 10 uh, chest X's in their life? Anybody? But one CT scan, one CT scan, head CT scan is say approximately some, how much? 100? 100 chest X-rays. One head CT. So that is the level of exposure we are giving to him. So some people will argue, okay, he will die of nephropathy later, later on, but let, him, let us save him. But then please uh, save your knowledge for him for that day. If you get some additional findings in pan CT, say a small pneumothorax or a few extra rib fractures or maybe a small grade 1 hematoma in liver, that's not going to kill him. What is going to save him is probably a, a result of your training which uh, with your clinical document you can pick up which are the important uh, injuries which are expected. Do a selective CT scan. See the mechanism of injury. Somebody who has fallen at ground level and got a first rib fracture, maybe you can let him be rather than somebody getting a first fracture after a high crash boat vehicle accident. So that answers all of it. You have to combine both your theoretical knowledge, the clinical acumen, and the facility what you have, the cost factor in the Indian scenario, the effects of radiation and ionizing radiations to the body, to the best uh, say outcome of the institution and the patient itself. But as of now, I think if we protocolize as per the institutions, that will be the best if we take all the stakeholders, the radiologists, the surgeons, the emergency medicine people, if they all agree on a common protocol, probably that will be the right thing to go for. That's my take. So, I'm very happy with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more thing which I feel that, uh, that getting this colorectal CT scan for all trauma patients that we have trained on. And what is the clinical acumen doing? What are, what are the personalities that is learning? Stay away and shift the patient to CT. And especially at nights, you have to wait for the reports. There's such a big delay coming. And for example, I, uh, a few days back, I had a case, blood injury, abdomen, fried case of, I can, it's a transplanting rupture. So our two postgraduates are got ready to send for CT. Is, you know, anybody that play unstable? I came, I just saw. All that we got to do is shift him to OT. By the time we shift him to CT scan, then I did contrast, then I did shift him back. We would have lost him. What is the point in just going and uh, just for the sake of the emergency purpose, you make uh, uh, I mean, uh, detailed reports and losing the patient there? We are actually shifted in directly and no reinstatement is required. Arrange for touch, fast is done. We receive what, uh, what are the results in fast. Later on, we can see everything else. Shift the patient to OT, finish, and he's a name boy. He was saved. Now, what I'm trying to tell is yeah, they should be supplementing us, but clinical knowledge should not go. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your valuable inputs. Now, I will request both moderators to kindly facilitate our speakers on the dance.
tissue perfusion is so important. Let's first address that. And uh, we look at lactate levels, capillary refill time, venous oxygenation, pulse pressure, stroke coagulation. Okay. So lactates is what we all do, we all see, but it is the only clinical parameter recommended to guide initial sepsis resuscitation because it assesses the adequate oxygenation. So this is in a patient coming with sepsis, and we know that lactate more than 2 millimoles per liter indicates hypoxia from septic shock. Now, we must remember that lactate can develop during sepsis from mechanisms other than hypoperfusion. So what can happen? There can be adrenergic overstimulation, beta 2 agonism, because of endogenous catecholamines or exogenous epinephrine, and this can also elevate sepsis. So when that will elevate lactate. So because lactate is also produced from anaerobic metabolism, which occurs secondary to hypoperfusion, a chronically impaired oxygen delivery in heart failure may come compound, confound measurement. Okay? So in heart failure, you have a chronically <coughs> impaired oxygen delivery, which the body is kind of managing or compensating. So that confounds measurement, and that's why uh, look at lactate with a little skepticism when you have a patient also coming with heart failure. So now capillary refill time seems to be a good parameter, easy parameter that can be done bedside. It has also been associated with an inadequate perfusion in cardiogenic shock states. However, if you have, uh, it may be prolonged in heart failure patients with low cardiac output. And if there is edema, then you might find it a little difficult to find a capillary refilling time. It has shown comparable and potentially superior lactate guided resuscitation. So it may be more reliable in patients with severe heart failure, especially those with a less, a very low ejection fraction where lactate may be constitutively elevated. So this easily doable and might be better. <coughs> However, the septic sepsis guidelines have not endorsed the CRT guided resuscitation. Coming to venous oxygenation, in sepsis, cardiac output is presumably normal or elevated, but the tissues are <coughs> unable to extract the oxygen secondary to the microcirculation dis disruption. Okay? So your cardiac output per se is normal, but you can't extract the oxygen. So the perseverance of cardiac output and low oxygen extraction in sepsis can cause a misleadingly elevated SpO2 or the central venous oxygen. Saturation. Now, I've talked about this one study, but there are studies that have reported. In, in his study, Benisaris has said that as many as 50% of patients with, an S, uh, with a central venous oxygen more than 70% at baseline were found to be fluid responsive during sepsis. So, this indicates that these were in need of volume replenishment, although. The, you had an apparently normal oxygenation. Okay, CVO2 was apparently normal. But they were still in need of fluid replenishment. So, are we really going by the venous oxygenation? Now, in cardiogenic shock, uh, patients will present with lower venous oxygenation, creating a common concern that low, the, the cardiac output in uh, cardiac failure may mask the compensatory increase in cardiac output during sepsis. And so again, it's a confounder for venous oxygenation measurements. Because in heart failure, you would have a low cardiac output. So that masks the increase in the, the low venous uh, oxygenation. So patients with chronic low cardiac output may maintain an adequate tissue oxygenation because they are used to that. In states of low mixed venous oxygenation, although supranormal oxygen extraction adaptations, because they are they have adapted themselves. So then again, you cannot target an SVO2 and SCVO2 in heart failure patients. It's not the best investigation to do, uh, or the best uh, yeah. So this has been reported in patients with chronic SVO2 as low as, low as 40%. So SVO2, SCVO2 should not be routinely used to guide resuscitation in sepsis where there is a pre-existing heart failure. And you know the SCVO2 is taken from the central line and uh, the other one is the venous one. We have another parameter that can be done and that is the pulse pressure variation. 
and the stroke volume variation. A pulse pressure variation is easily done because all you need is an arterial line. And these rely on cyclical intrathoracic pressure changes that happens during mechanical ventilation. So it relies on that to assess your fluid resuscitation status. Now they are dynamic readings and hence they are superior to a central, uh, to a CVP. No, CVP is static. Whereas uh, these are dynamic readings and so they are superior. So both pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation would measure the increase in cardiac output during inspiration. And more profound increases in cardiac output suggests less fluid responsiveness which is reflected by a higher PPP, PPV and a stroke volume uh, variation. Now what happens in heart failure? In heart failure, the presence of a right ventricular or left ventricular dysfunction may diminish the accuracy of the uh, PPV. Also, when the right ventricular systolic function is impaired because the right ventricular afterload is increased, or the right ventricular contract, uh, contraction is uh, affected. No? So there's a contractile dysfunction. So it is not impaired because of decreased RV preload. It is impaired because of an increased afterload or a decreased contractility. So therefore, your pulse pressure variation may be falsely indicative of fluid responsiveness. It is not very reliable. However, also, the heart failure spectrum has varying degrees, degrees of right ventricular and left ventricular dysfunction. So this variation would be more relevant in right heart failure secondary to pulmonary hypertension. It's, all this can lead to exaggerated PPV and SVV because the total pressure increases also are likely to have a greater magnitude of effect <coughs> when applied to dysfunctional ventricles. So again, you have to look at these values differently as, uh, as opposed to just looking at these values with the patient having sepsis. So sepsis with a heart failure present, you would have to re-look at the values. Mean arterial pressure we all know is uh, uh, the mean arterial pressure at the 65 is what we are aiming at and it's easy to measure directly or indirectly. And pulmonary artery catheter pressures also if you insert a PAC then you would get your PA systolic, diastolic pressure, the wedge pressure, CVP, cardiac output. Everything would be gone and it's, but, and it's an indirect measure of LV, EBP. But is it easy to insert and is it easy to insert in an emergency department? So this is a pressure that we can, this is a technique we can look at, but more in the ICU setup, if at all. Its main use, however, would be in cardiogenic and septic shock underlying cardiac disease. So it is a useful uh, I mean, it's a useful uh, investigation of investigation of, uh, what do you call it? It's, yeah, it's useful to you. Again, coming to role of echocardiogram. An echo, if you do an echo, it's, it measures your endiastolic ventricular volume and it defines your level of preload. It's the best way to calculate your left ventricular diameter, surface and volume to assess LV function. And it definitely would help you to diagnose the sh to diagnose shock. However, point of care ultrasound, it does predict fluid responsiveness in patients with sepsis, with pre-existing heart failure. But there is a, uh, there can be observer error and potential harm. So in an emergency department, if you don't have someone who's very good at doing the point of care ultrasound, you might get wrong values. And then your treatment also might be warped because of the wrong interpretation because of the observer variance. So in the emergency, you should not use your point of care ultrasound prior to guideline recommended fluid resuscitation. So I'm not saying don't do it, but don't let it stop your guideline uh, recommended fluid resuscitation unless you have an expert who is doing it. So this is a table on impact of heart failure on sepsis resuscitation parameters. It's the same thing that told you, so I just so I quickly go through it. So lactate. Measure it unless you have edema that is not letting you measure it adequately. The PPV and SPV is most profound in right heart failure, secondary to pulmonary hypertension. So. 
because of an increased RE afterload and the CVP is no longer expensive because you have other things that are more useful. So let's now come to management strategies. One would be fluid resuscitation. So I'm only talking of management strategies relevant to sepsis with heart failure, not the common management that we would do. So two things are important. One is fluid resuscitation and the second would be vasopressors and inflows. So coming to fluid, in, uh, fluid resuscitation, what does surviving sepsis guidelines say? They say 30 ml of per kg fluid bolus of crystals within 3 hours of presentation corrects hypotension regardless of comorbidities. So you can give this 30 ml within 3 hours even in a patient with heart failure because regardless of comorbidities it would help. They will have because of the pathophysiology of the sepsis per se you will not err giving the fluids and it's recommended. So the early goal directed therapy was the basis of delivering large fluid boluses to all patients. However, we know that the EGDT and its targets have been questioned for a lot. Many of the trials that have been done and many studies that have done, which have refuted their efficiency. So why have they refuted their efficiency? Because they say there's so much intensity of care without actually seeing clinical benefits for all this. So is that much intensity of care warranted if the clinical benefits are not as much so? But having said that, we would still give the so, we have to, however, keep in mind the large fluid boluses like 30 kg per kg may lead to a fluid overload followed by pulmonary edema requiring mechanical ventilation. But if you give it, if you didn't, don't give it quickly and you give it over 3 hours, then likelihood of this occurring would be less. And fluid overload has been linked to increased mortality in critically ill patients. Patients with heart failure have increasing circulatory blood volume and or dilated ventricles. So the preload is increased at the baseline itself. And the preload, we aim to decrease the preload pharmacologically through venous dilation to treat patients with severe heart failure. So this is opposite of what we do for patients with sepsis. Isn't it? In sepsis we are giving fluids, whereas here they are aiming at reducing the preloads. So this Influence of the combined effects of these fluid and hemodynamic dysregulations does warrant concern and careful monitoring of patients by giving them fluids. So to summarize about fluids, <coughs> patients presenting with sepsis and pre-existing heart failure should not be deprived of the recommended 30 ml per kg bolus crystal fluid or acute resuscitation. I'll give you the references for whatever I've said at the, at the end. Achieving a 30 ml per kg of fluid by 3 hours, they say, is a reasonable goal in sepsis with pre-existing heart failure as it has improved outcome in, outcomes in patients with sepsis. However, caution has to be advised in patients with advanced heart failure. So research is still going on on these groups with a very low ejection fraction of say less than 15%. There is no conclusive evidence as yet. So after acute fluid resuscitation, a conservative fluid strategy is then reasonable. So you do your acute resuscitation, then be conservative and monitor the patients. Uh, but again, to actually formulate guidelines in a protocol, we still need more research and more guidelines forthcoming. Okay, so with that, we'll go to the pharmacological considerations for patients in sepsis with heart failure. What are we looking at? The two, uh, the, I mean the group of inotropes and vasopressors. So why? Because if you have uh, inadequate response to fluid resuscitation, then you would need to fall back on the vasopressors when the vascular space should be full, so adequate preload with a good pulmonary capital wedge pressure, but the MAP should still be less than 65. And which drug is what we're going to look at. So if you look at vasopressors, they're used in septic shock, but they're used, is this new? So they are used in septic shock, but they are used in cardiogenic shock is more subtle. Okay. So the current heart failure recommendations, what do they recommend? A decrease in ventricular afterload and they aim to optimize cardiac preload. Why is this done? To increase the cardiac output with a decreased myocardial oxygen demand. 
So this is what you tend to do in, this is what you need to do in heart failure. So what do vasopressors do? They increase the afterload which may decrease the cardiac output. So cardiac output in heart failure benefits more from a, from a reduced afterload. That is a vasopressors would increase the afterload. So too much vasopressor mediated afterload increase may especially impair cardiac function in heart failure. So we have to be careful when choosing our vasopressors. They may cause fluid redistribution from the venous system and promote a fluid shift into the pulmonary space leading to a pulmonary edema. These mechanisms would form a framework for typically avoiding vasopressors in heart failure patient. However, in the setting of sepsis and chronic heart failure, the management again has is confounded. So you have to check and monitor and give the patient. So norepinephrine, surviving sepsis guidelines represent norepinephrine is the first time vasopressor and sepsis and septic shock. How does it act? It mediates arterial constriction via alpha-1 adrenergic agonism and limited positive anotropy is observed through beta-1 stimulation. So noradrenaline also may directly stimulate coronary vessel dilatation in failing hearts. So this mixed action has created an interest in the role of norepinephrine in hemodynamic support during cardiogenic shock. So in sepsis, with cardiac failure, heart failure, norepinephrine is recommended, is the first drug that we need to use. It's found to be safe and effective in patients with sepsis and cardiac dysfunction and should remain the first line vasopressor in patients with septic shock with heart failure. What about the second drug? is vasopressin. So the second line therapy for a refractory shock, with, they would have a relative deficiency of uh, vasopressin and it would permit withdrawal of other vasopressors. I'll also come, I'll also show you on the chart about vasopressin anotropusin in uh, septic sepsis <coughs> heart failure. Okay. What about epinephrine? There's limited data to support the use of epinephrine in sepsis and septic shock with pre-existing heart failure. And there are in the arrhythmogenic side effects without hemodynamic benefits doesn't really encourage the use of epinephrine. What about dopamine? Data on dopamine for sepsis with pre-existing heart failure are limited and there are greater adverse effects with higher doses used in septic shocks. So they don't also advocate, the guidelines don't also advocate the use of dopamine. Coming to Inotropic agents. So sepsis with pre-existing heart failure may present a mixed picture. You have a mixed picture of cardiogenic as well as septic shock, possibly through sepsis-induced myocardial dysfunction or by hypoperfusion hypo from sepsis. So what happens? Inotropes increase the cardiac output, especially once extensive fluid resuscitation and vasoconstriction has failed to correct perfusion. So that's when you go to them. So what do we use? Dobutamine can be considered as a second line vasoactive agent as an adjunct to norepinephrine for sepsis with pre-existing heart failure, presenting with concerns for reduced cardiac output and in, uh, re in, that is in severe reduced ejection fraction heart failure, it is preferred. Mildrenone, because of hypotensive effects in sepsis and lack of efficacy in acute heart failure, it should not be used during the acute resuscitative phase. So why am I talking about it? Because it can be used cautiously after stabilization if there are concerns for catabolic toxicity and or reduced to inefficiency and also there is concomitant beta blocker usage. So beta blockers and angio angiotensin inhibition. Patients with chronic heart failure are likely managed with, they are given, no, this is the heart failure regime beta blockers, angiotensin converting enzymes, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin, angiotensin receptor blockers or angiotensin receptor nephrilicin inhibitors. So these, this is the regime that they, are, they would be on. Now beta blockers have been of interest in sepsis because evidence has shown profound overstimulation of the adrenergic receptors contributes to cardiac dysfunction. And during sepsis, beta blockers attenuate inflammatory cytokines they improve cardiac function, counteract metabolic dysregulation and prevent the negative consequences from sympathetic overstimulation. 
and that's why they are of interest in sepsis. So, because of the benefits of beta blocker continuation in sepsis and acute decompensated heart failure, continuation of the beta blockers or chronic beta blockers in the setting of sepsis and heart failure should be strongly considered. So, continue whatever beta blockers the patient is on. What about ACE inhibitors and ARBs? They should be stopped due to unstable blood pressures and renal dysfunction in sepsis. And they can be restarted after stabilization. While they restarted to resume the heart failure based management. What about atrial fibrillation? So heart failure, impaired left ventricle ejection fraction and sepsis are independently and additively. So they are independently associated with a lot of arrhythmias as well as collectively. So you get a lot of arrhythmias, increased incidence of arrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation. And acute onset atrial fibrillation represents up to 70% of the supraventricular arrhythmias that, is, that are seen in sepsis. So it, the, what, what does it cause? It causes a hemodynamic consequence, hemodynamic compromise. And hemodynamic consequences of antiarrhythmic drugs also are a common concern in sepsis and septic shock. And what is advocated for guidelines for AFSA? Only electrical cardioversion in hemodynamically unstable patients. But the evidence for AF management with great control through beta blockers does support their application as a first line option in patients with heart failure. Okay, so this is the these are the guidelines for septic, the recent guidelines for septic shock with pre-existing heart failure. It's been published and I'll, I'll share the publication. So it says that 30, to 50, uh, 30 ml of uh, per kg crystalloid fluid, fluid bolus by 3 hours unless there is a strong evidence for potential harm. And you are able to see it properly on the screen. Then what about monitoring? So all this goes down to 24 hours. Okay. So what happens about monitoring? Less than 3 liters by 6 hours is preferred if the ejection fraction is less than 40 percent is again the guideline. So you monitor by physical exam, capillary refill time, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, lactate trends, but interpret the lactate trends cautiously and point of care ultrasound after you give the initial fluid bolus. So do not withhold the initial fluid bolus because of your to do the point of care ultrasound because of the interpretation. Then what about the vasopressors or the vasoactive agents? So the first line is norepinephrine. Then is vasopressin, which is the first addition to norepinephrine. Then we have epinephrine, which is second line. Consider earlier if hyporesponsive to norepi. And dopamine, which is third line, preferably you are advocated to avoid its use. Now what about inotropes? Dobutamine generally avoid use, but we consider severe cardiac output or CO impairment. And metronome can be considered if hemodynamically stable with concerns for low CO or a patient's receiving beta blockers. Now, what about atrial fibrillation or short term rate controls? You can use esmolol, diltaisin if there are contraindications contradi to esmolol, amiodarone if significant hemodynamic is instability, and a ditch should be avoided. Now, in septic tachycardia, minimize the use of inotropes and epinephrine. Esmolol infusion at 24 hours and chronic beta blocker uh, continuation. So these are the guidelines for septic shock with pre-existing um, heart failure. Okay, so coming to supportive care, your uh, positive pressure ventilatory support at B and RRT, real replacement therapy in sepsis, has been well evaluated and it does. And does not demonstrate benefit over delayed strategies. So you don't have to use it immediately because it's not more beneficial over delayed strategies. And remember that you don't use it specifically in sepsis with a pre-existing heart failure. So in pre-existing heart failure, you use RRP for supportive care because of the sepsis-induced kidney injury. You don't use it to manage the heart failure through its status. Okay, it's used to manage the um, uh, a kidney injury. Now the risk of intradialytic hypotension is slightly enhanced in heart failure patients with sepsis, so you to keep that in mind. And careful application of RRT should be implemented in this patient.
conditions because they might go into an overload. So this is the summary of the vasoactive agents recommendation um, in uh, sepsis with heart failure. So use norepinephrine as first line for patients with septic shock on vasopressors. Uh, target a MAP of 65. Consider invasive monitoring of arterial blood pressure because that gives you the PP uh, read. If central access is not yet available, consider initi in, initi uh, initiating vasopressors peripherally. Now, when you use uh, vasopressors peripherally, you use it for a very short period till you then get a central line. If MAP is inadequate, despite low to moderate dose of tor epi, consider as adding vasopressin. And in case there is cardiac dysfunction with persistent hypotension, hypoperfusion, despite adequate body status and blood pressure, then you will add dobutamine or switch to epinephrine. So to summarize, traditional fluid resuscitation targets do not increase the risk of adverse events in heart failure patients with sepsis and likely improve their outcomes. Norepinephrine remains the most well-supported vasopressor for patients with sepsis with pre-existing heart failure, while dopamine may induce more cardiac adverse events. Dobutamine can be combined with norepi in patients with low cardiac output. Management of chronic heart failure medications warrants careful consideration for continuation or discontinuation after development of sepsis. So once you stabilize the patient, then you can go back to it. Beta blockers may be appropriate to continue in the absence of acute hemodynamic decompensation. Optimal management of AF may include beta blockers after acute hemodynamic stabilization because they have shown independent benefits in sepsis. And positive pressure ventilatory support to renal replacement must be carefully monitored for effects on cardiac function when you have heart failure with sepsis. So um, this is a very nice article in uh, the journal Intensive Care Medicine 2021, Sepsis with Pre-Existing Heart Failure and the Surviving uh, Sepsis Campaign International Guidelines for Sepsis and Septic Shock in 2021. Critical Care Journal. Okay. So with that, thank you. Now, almost all the units are having echo and ultrasonography. 
So we have to make use of it. We have to measure the VTI, the velocity, time integral, the changes with the millennium challenges. And all those things should be used collectively to manage the patient, whoever the patient is in such, especially the patients with heart failure, who is continuous monitoring and a close monitoring with uh, uh, administration of fluids. We can't deprive them of fluids definitely. And that any role of cardiac output monitoring devices, which are like, coming up kind of like post, any, uh, uh, like you have got any, any experience with it, like, and can be used in such situations. In the ER, no, not really. I don't personally have any experience. But if anyone else in the audience can answer the question, they... Maybe the ICU, I can hold it to Not really. We don't, not in the ER. But uh, I guess the ICU is good. Maybe have something. Anything um, you want to add? Adu? My question is the Because most of the patients who are in shock, they are either being referred from the other hospital. Where they would have only sufficient fluids given. Because you know, one of the side was saying that even IVC is there was a the capital immunity, all are good, to still give them both the fluids for us. So, patient or hospital patient, the combinations are there, all the lungs can be given from the DMR. Still, the fluid was given or again, I think, for the answer is possible to give Yeah, so uh, your question was that if the patient has already been treated somewhere else and come to you, so he's already got the, edi the initial fluids. So then we have, we have to also do clinically. If the patient isn't terminally edema, then we can't give more fluids. So we have to clinically examine the patient to uh, check the parameters. If he's already fluid overloaded, then we would not give. We do an echo, we do an ultrasound, and then decide. Yeah. That's why we think that nothing will be a dictum kind of like we have to assess and go ahead with, uh, based upon the treatment of So the guidelines, the septic, the guidelines for sepsis in heart failure definitely say 30 ml per kg. In spite of comorbidities, you would give it over. Three Bar cardiogenic shock comes in, uh, the residents are trying to start a dopamine therapy, which is not recommended at all because of its high arrhythmogenic potential. So, the first line of uh, drug, even for a cardiogenic shock, to increase the endocrine perfusion is norogenic. So, that is the first line, and second line, in any shock, norogenic is the first line, second line is vasopressin. Dopamine uh, is not like much recommended, maybe dobutamine if we are suspecting a cardiogenic shock. If it's adequately filled, if the system is adequately filled and still uh, we are suspecting a cardiogenic shock, dopamine is recommended along with norepinephrine, nor but not uh, dopamine. In the same lines, uh, this was a difficult topic to discuss and manage to tackle it very nicely. And uh, as Dr. was seeing earlier, we were monitoring the coronary capillary vesicles and then managing patients not in the ER exactly, but in, as we go down to the ICU and then do some more monitoring. Of the and then the medication. Heart failure and sepsis is a very different area. And as 
kernel is we try to hold the fluids in a very strict way, and that's where the dilemma comes: <laughs> how much to give and how much not to give. Right? Yeah, because the sepsis pathology is stale. Yeah, exactly. And the reason why the patient, the sepsis pathology stays, but heart failure is one big uh, confounder there. Yeah. 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 Just mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much to our honorable guests for such insightful talk. And now we will move on to the felicitation part. Requesting the moderators, Dr. Neenaka Nam and um, Dr. Rajnika Ansar to kindly felicitate Dr. Neenaka. We would now like to request Dr. Kalpana Nam to kindly felicitate our moderators. Saturation. And then there are some of the form factor where it will be associated 
and definitely it's an apt perspective. For example, as you mentioned, it can be like normal and suddenly the patient may come in collapse just a. So with any patients uh, with pulmonary embolism, so there are the, there won't be any specific uh, any symptoms they come normal. Like uh, patients with cardiac cardiac problem, they eliminate uh, the the whatever symptoms will be modified and amplified. So the patient is not able to give all this factor. Uh, it will affect the uh, like. Uh, I clinical suspicion is required in case of PE with I clinical suspicion with some uh, algorithms like scores with investigation and all the clinical decision what we make. I think it will as a whole it will help and it's very difficult with only with symptoms and signs. Right. So sir, what about the different diagnostic algorithms that are useful for the diagnosis of PE and also risk application of patients? So there are a lot of diagnostic algorithms which are going to help with the emergency requirement. There is uh, PERC, uh, that is country policy, New York, Katina, there is well school, there is Geneva group. So all of the parameters of all these scores are very similar. You know, hypothesis or active cancer are also very similar. So which could we be using for better management of patients in the country? So in terms of talking about um, when we talk about uh, what is this type of and uh, what is the uh, device in this course. So, so in the first criteria is basically used to rule out uh, any embolism if you are thinking in terms of uh, so that is uh, they have this uh, um, uh, where the, one of the points in work uh, is about you know, uh, having that this jet, the suspicion of uh, PE is very high. So when you say that part, the whole thing goes out there, you, you are totally, totally biased. That is where your other things come into picture. Uh, your wet criteria and uh, uh, the revising also. So, per group, one of the best part about it is uh, when, once the score is less than two, then uh, you know, the whole uh, thing changes, your management changes, you don't need to. That means that means this patient can be sent home comfortably, and uh, in these species probably your uh, the role of D-dimer comes into picture. Right? And if you do the D-dimer, they are uh, these are the patients with, for whom you can do a D-dimer. Because once you decide that uh, if you're going to do a CTPA, you can go straight away for the no need to do a D-dimer. So these patients do a D-dimer uh, done. The fees for per room are less than two. And uh, uh, so these are the patients. If renal is negative, these patients it is a rule not totally. Uh, so these are the patients who can be sent off. Uh, uh, coming to the your well um, score and uh, general score, the risk stratification is basically to say whether it is a uh, you know a, a massive embolism, a submassive, or I mean this is classified depending on the be. So in this, what happens is, uh, if you use, if you go with the chest guidelines, which they, they, they say PE with hypertension, PE without hypertension, and then low PE. And then as if you go by the uh, AHA, so they say uh, massive embolism, submassive, so and then uh, low embolism. All the three things, even the neuropsychiatric hypertension also, but they divide that as the intermediate risk in the second uh, category. So in this criteria, it is either the scores are less than two or two to, two to four and above six. Uh, certain parameters which are used uh, in uh, reverse Geneva score it is using uh, it is three less than three, three to six and uh, more than three to nine more than that. So that is how it is. Approximately 10% of patients who are categorized as low risk actually had uh, massive complete embolism which went on to other packages. So, uh, how do we tackle this kind of a problem? Because this is not ultimate, where the yes, this patient is low risk at and uh, the cancer can go. No, I think uh,
you can be okay actually, rather than a single shot and then sort of you go home. It's difficult to say that because they are a different subset. It's, it's very uh, wrong that it goes or probably wrong it goes for many of the things. So it's like, it's like a uh, challenging diagnosis that we can say we are. So I think once you know the previous probability, whether it's like mild, moderate or probably or low, medium or high risk features probability that you have all those features suggest your or symptoms in terms of uh alcoholism then you have a scoring index. I think they probably may have a fairly good idea of whether he is like low, medium or uh, high risk category. Probably the, all these scores also uh, will play a significant role in Geneva and uh, I think other member of the severity index, modified PC, all these things will have a significant role in assessing the risk distribution of patients. Probably it's better to keep them uh, either in the separation wall or maybe a stubborn issue or something of that sort and then try to assess them correctly. So that even if, as you said, even the low risk people had a massive number so it's difficult to explain. Once you know he has some suspicion, I think it is better to watch them in the system for 24 hours, make sure everything is fine, echo, in case it is required, do a CTP also. Have all those things, maybe you can add up some cardiac biomarkers like NT4, PCP, and then drop in 9. You have all these things at your disposal, I think you can reassure the patient in a confident way and then tell them that looks fine and probably we can discharge them. Uh, you can move them from here to the ward and then try to do it. <coughs> Uh, your um, risk of taking 
you have to be there and the question in PDF and uh, security. So the security questions are not allowed both sides of uh, correlation problems. Either they can crawl or lead. So we also here would be like, suppose we would have given wrongly provided the piece without any evidence, then it just lands up in the and read. Accepted. Because they can read easily. But I think you have all the features rescue of color embolism, which is massive, which is making a crash, then I think you have a strong point to do thrombolysis. You don't need to do any uh, ultrasound or CDPA. You're not taking so much of time. You have to thrombolyze him, open up the PA, let the perfusion happen, then you can do ultrasound. Ultrasound will take its due time. Yes. So, and uh, the echo is done, and I had a patient who had a history of surgery two weeks back. One of the comorbidities, he came, came to us, he came again at us, PEA. So it could, it could be anything. The only thing that we did was, oh, it was slightly on the intermediate side, so we, were, we didn't have a diagram of whether to thrombolize because the child that is thrombolizing is controversial topic. So whether to give thrombolysis or okay. where, uh, so that was one thing which I wanted to ask. The cardiac arrest or prolonged CPR rather is a contraindication. Uh, cardiac arrest is not a standard contraindication. Long CPR, and probably we do not thrombolyze uh, even in acute kidney syndrome also, respiration in there also. So I think uh, if the suspicion is high, I think you have a solid reason to do the go on the treatment of thrombolysis. You can talk to family and tell them this is what that will save the life of the patient. Otherwise, we have nothing else to do. Ultrasound and then nothing. I think rather we have recently in our the hospital patient. Of, a mid-day 55-year-old patient uh, who was diagnosed with uh, CEO and with multiple metastasis who had left up on him left up on him BBT then with all blebs and all those things so she was due for a facial for me in case she developed some partner syndrome so left up on him BBT we thought probably not very known to cause uh, pandemic inversion but just uh, doing anti-correlation and supporting management with antibodies so I thought for today she crashed and the saturation went down hypotension almost the rest I could do CPI in the ward and she tried to precise you. You have not done anything else but thrombolysis. Just thrombolysis. The duty place. She went from ready to support She came over. So I think rather than probably try to get us some more evidence to have the thrombolysis being done, we can save time and then you, have, you, you can support your diagnosis with uh, echo. Echo should be, at least echo is attached. Echo at least echo. This is your own goal, and I'm just going to give you two times a year. So I think in these kind of cases, we can, uh, since the crashing patient, the VP is low, we can uh, think of early starting of pressures rather than uh, pushing in fluids and worsening the condition and you know, creating a problem. We can start off pressures. Maybe uh, epinephrine is the one very good choice. And it will help also during the intra resuscitation time. And like we said, we can plan for an intra resuscitation for what is this pathway. I think with this thing, and like I said, we need to just sort. Even though the score is low, like we said in the beginning, it is the clinical to just sort which actually puts into. So even literature also states that the years of practice the decision has in making the diagnosis is much more valuable than the you know, written criteria which are there on the paper. I just have one, I think in all these things, uh, practically speaking, when we kind of see that there is, there, is, there is a lot of legal implications, there is a monetary thing involved, whenever we say, and this is the decision we have to take uh, in the year, which is, which is uh, the duration, the time we have is very less. This is a very small window of opportunity for us here. I think probably uh, having some guidelines earlier, uh, maybe at the central level, can definitely yeah. keep it designed. Yeah. So, as we mentioned, in the cardiac arrest, we have to note why we had child fighting. I think that clarifies uh, the prognosis. Uh, one the thing is, uh, when there is you no know, absolute current uh, indication for uh, systemic trauma, uh, we said we confirmed uh, PE, yeah, cardiac arrest. One of the indications along with the massive PE, and as uh, Dr. Shai has mentioned, uh, we need to discuss with the family because of the 
the cost by the H1 to consider. And uh, the is not very cheap. So, and uh, talking about the outcome, explaining it to the patient attenders, explaining the cost, the risk of hemorrhage. So, how do we go about counseling the patient's letters regarding the same? This is where the team work comes. <laughs> so, yeah, we can take care and we can uh, uh, take that team members to explain the things. And uh, so, one thing we can use, uh, we can make uh, uh, like uh, body plays, uh, uh, connective plays, which are more, much, much more costly. And also, a recent uh, European uh, guidelines. Here also, they advocate use of the streptokinase. Uh, Bonus with the infusion of one lakh uh, over uh, 22, 24 hours. So that's a tricky situation. That is where uh, uh, your expertise, communication skills, and teamwork. So just it's not managing of the PE clinically. So teamwork is very much essential for the any outcome during the crashing patients and situations. So I think uh, it depends on the type of consultant, whether it is your submassive or uh, Then you can probably put them on the oral, uh, oral anticoagulants. That is the MAC. That's where you can think of uh, longer, you know, the longer, uh, probably, and uh, that's the you can decide on the thrombolysis. Probably that is where you think of thrombolysis. That's like Dr. Fisher said, we use an RTPA, that's the thrombolysis. Yeah, that's the thrombolysis. So, what about the patient who's not having any symptoms? Do you have any advice for them? Uh, yeah, that's where you can think of the thrombolysis. Yeah, that's where you can think of the thrombolysis. Yeah, that's where you can think of the thrombolysis. Then, I think the other thing is your massive one. Uh, or in the radical situation. If it is clearly diagnosed, uh, diagnosis is already established, then I think there is no second drop. You need to go ahead with the bomb glasses. Simultaneously doing the resuscitation. Discussing, I just have one point before. <laughs> so that discussion with the family is very important because you are together with the cost and then the implications of that also, then the chance of bleeding also. Although it's very, very less, but I think still you have to talk about it. So earlier, uh, all US FDA approved agents were like streptokinase, eurokinase, they were much, much reasonable actually, what we have now, and if I play, if you play, if you play, probably all those things will work in the same way. Small difference in internal bridges there definitely. Streptokinase can cause slightly high rates of internal bridge. But I think if there is a concern for financial uh, preparedness, probably, I think we can still uh, back to your I think you can still better on streptokinase, it will really work. <laughs> Of course, if you have a mostly still, I think, uh, a serious memory, I think, it shouldn't be a problem. Because then it means we are comfortable with you you just one step and that's it. We can <laughs> cover the decision. But I think step by is, the slow and steady infusion will, will, will be always advertised. I think uh, that's how you look at it and step by step will The same way also. So I think the other thing is anti-regulation. We have moved away from vitamin K antibodies to the West totally. And if you look like, as the Dr. Hitzel has said, uh, low risk is like only probably more than once you can put more risk or if it's like <coughs> moderate or high risk, then the things will be different. We normally, if the patients are admitted, we give them simple unfashioned heparin for five days or seven days. And the next dose of heparin we stop and then put them on the much directly. And two days we observe them and then we continue with uh, low risk, any low risk. Only thing to remember in low risk is the age of her. Which is very important, and depending on the age of the weight, I think we can take it off of that. The books are done, the most safest, and then we can still uh, work with it. The other issue is uh, the chance of bleeding with all these nomads. So, my practical also, we talk about this uh, IVC filter, so from back to the Is it practically beneficial or is it a therapeutic? IVC filters are like. Acutely, there's no role. Uh, we have only two indications uh, for IVC filter that is 
patients who have got strong contraindication for anticoagulation and patients who have sustained recurrent episodes of coronary embolism despite anticoagulation, then we have IVC filter. Now IVC filters are retrievable and then uh, earlier we were just putting IVC filter and that's it, continue anticoagulation for almost lifetime. Right so I think now with the risk gets diminished probably 6 weeks or 8 weeks down the line, we can take away the filter and then probably put him on oral anticoagulation. And how do we use pregnancy and pulpy abortion? So how do we diagnose it? And which is not available in all centers. So how do we diagnose pulpy abortion and pregnancy and how do we start the management? So we consider pregnancy. The most important thing is fetus. So effect of the fetus. So if you see the effect of the fetus by the way of the uh, <coughs> radiation exposure, it is actually higher in the VQ per future than your and one more thing, if you consider the effect on fetus, to have an effect on fetus, radiation like they say 0.1 gray, but a CT pulmonary angiogram, one CT pulmonary angiogram, the radiation exposure is around 0 0.01 gray. This is one tenth of the pathological uh, effect uh, radiation needed. So we can consider directly going for CTPA if you are uh, having the highest species of PT. Pregnancy. So, the risk application, do we apply to the pregnancy patients or is it Yes, we can apply the risk application, but in a pregnancy, uh, D-Diamond uh, has no role because it is variation uh, there in all the three trimester. So, apart from that, you can use hydrocardiography as you can uh, a Doppler scan, a 2 point Doppler scan, and uh, always uh, your CT pulmonary angiogram remains the gold standard. So I do want to discuss regarding other modalities of management which is uh, surgical embolectomy and catheter directed uh, thrombolysis. So this is not, uh, all centers will not be equipped with it, but uh, what kind of patients will benefit from it and uh, how is it useful? No, catheter directed thrombolysis is done in the catheter actually. Then we expect that systemic thrombolysis is carrying high risk of intracellular in such patients. Then probably this is an option. This is not a class only indication for CD. Uh, yeah. So uh, you can't directly take them to catheter and then do this like uh, primary PCA intervention for study. If the patient, you feel that he has got high risk features of bleeding, accelerated hypertension, or uh, standard uh, risk factors for being that we then you probably can give them an option of CDT. CDT is like we take an access from the femoral vein and go to the PA and go to the pulmonary injectum, see where it's at. And then keep a catheter there, either a pictorial catheter. There are various catheters actually. There are only two three principles of uh, action of these things. One is uh, you just keep a catheter in the thrombus and then try to start thrombolysis. Or you can fragment the thrombus or you can break the thrombus by rotating the picture and then try to expose various phases of the clot to the agent. Or you can, once you fragment them with ultrasound or whatever it is, you can suck them out. There are so many things that have come out actually like penumbra or angiovac and then simple picture characters. So it's just a lot of spectrum is there in, in all this intermediate devices. Um, you can still go with angiovac also, but I think huge French size, you need a bypass for that actually. So in patients who have got IVC thrombosis, so there we can't enter the heart only. In such patients we can bring in angiovac. So I think but I think there are high interventions is not available easily across the spectrum of hospitals. What we have on hand in the left system thrombosis and if you feel patients have got high risk features, we can do them an option of CDT. Especially all this comes into in patients of massive other interventions. Other patients who are we will be managing them with protein uh, medications. Surgical embolectomy is still uh, valid actually and then patient has got high risk features and is not clinical for catheter thrombolysis or it is not available, then mm -hmm. probably surgical embolectomy should be done. Surgical embolectomy has got lesser risk, almost like around now with the recent uh, all, uh, innovations, it's around 6% or so moderately surgical embolectomy. And then they are only valid when the thrombus is in main PA or the just at the proximal sequence of uh, RP or IP, so that what we call as sandal embolus. In such kinds of uh, presentations, embolus presenting in MP, RP, LP, then the surgeon can go in and then try to do the embolus. If it is distal, if they, they are not going to talk about the distal sequence of MP, RP. So there will not be any uh, use of it. Surgical embolus is still right. We do 
motion uh, for the and stuff like that. And uh, Tanvi, what is
Thanks for watching this man. We have on all the treatment varieties. What is the textbook? But we just actually as of now. This has been there for some time now, not uh, recently. So we are able to manage those things. Uh, and many of this, many of the schemes also probably they give a, uh, some sanction of money is there, especially the Andhra schemes, and then uh, where we can bring in CDT also, then surgical management of the coronary prism also. They, they have codes for extensibility. So, no, this is for extensibility. This is a code given in one of the states. So, I think mean, <laughs> probably we should be exploring that all the time. Uh,
the resistive load of the airways and also the elastic load of the alveolus itself. So if I were to inflate it, the first one is always going to be the hardest. So let me do it for you guys. So that first bench was more difficult than this second bench that I am going to put in. Clearly stating that my first bench was the recruitment of this alveoli, which is the basis of my talk, which is the basis of NIV. So NIV recruits alveoli, hence helping us with oxygenation and ventilation. So at this time we would have thought, are there any indications for the use of NIV? So multiple literature searches <coughs> have shown us that there is strong evidence and good level of recommendation in strong recommendation and good level of evidence for the use of NIV in acute exacerbation of COPD, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, immunocompromised patients, and facilitation of or weaning of patients in COPD patients. Both the you know uh, literature search of both uh, the sources are you know mirroring the same thing with the addition of obesity in the second uh, lit literature review. But at this time, if I were to ask. If I were to only do a PubMed mesh search or an advanced search for NIV, what are my results? It shows that in pulmonary edema itself, there are 25 robust RCTs, 6 meta analysis. In COPD, on the other hand, there are 84 RCTs and 20 meta analysis backing up the use of NIV. And in chest trauma and in immunocompromised patients, there are 8 RTs, RCTs and multiple observational studies. So if I were to take a few studies from this cohort and discuss them for you, in the beginning, in acute exacerbation of COPD or respiratory failure, the first and foremost trial was done by Pratt et al. and it was published in NEJM in 2015. It was also known as the Florali 1 study with a sample size of 310. As you can see, HFNC versus NIV, in the intubation rates, NIV had a higher rate of incidence of intubation, but as you can also see, the p value is not statistically significant. Whereas in 90 day mortality, there was a statistically significant favor in the HFNC cohort of patients. Moving on to acute pulmonary edema, this was published in Acute Medical and Surgical Journal in 2020 June. And the studies show that in this forest plot, there is definite favor of NIV in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is statistically significant. Also favoring <coughs> hypercapnia IPC, but the B value is not statistically significant. Moving on to chest trauma patients or patients with uh, uh, any sort of trauma. This was a meta-analysis published in 2013 in Intensive Care Medicine. It shows that all of the RCTs in this meta-analysis show that NIV reduced mortality by increasing oxygenation, ventilation and also recruiting excretory muscles, thereby you know, avoiding the splinting of that side that patients usually do when they have a brain chest. Moving on to immunocompromised patients, this was a study which was done by Van et al. Published in Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2020, it was 8 RCTs with a sample size of 2,197 patients, showing that there was no significant difference in mortality or intubation rates in NIV versus HFNC, but if you look at the ICU stay, HFNC cohort had a shorter ICU stay, saying that HFNC is mildly more beneficial in patients who are immunocompromised. So finally, when HFNC versus conventional oxygen therapy was NIV, this was a non-inferiority study. It showed that there was no difference in the intubation rates or no difference in the mortality rates as per the forest plot which has been shown. So if I were to summarize, it says that NIV has a definitely superior physiological rationale. NIV has a history dating back to more than 100 years. Approximately 70 or more articles are there with robust evidence, multiple meta-analysis and it has strong recommendation, high levels of evidence in COPD, pulmonary edema and respiratory failure. But my first number one take home message is that always, always treat the patient and not the ABG. Moving on to my rebuttal, so I have a few slides for the rebuttal. So if I, when I did a literature search of NIV versus HFNC, I found that there were 16 RCTs and 5 meta-analysis in literature to relate and most of them are in the last 2 years. So when I compared few of the meta-analysis, the first one was published in the Journal of Critical Care in 2020 to November and showed that there was no difference in mortality, intubation or length of stay which was statistically different in the NIV or HFNC cohort. It had 8 RCTs and a sample size of 527. <coughs> Moving on to the second meta-analysis which was 8 RCTs with a sample size of 612. As you can see, in the patients with a no hypercapnia cohort or the 
patients which did not have hyperthermia, the incubation rates were much lesser in the LRE cohort as compared to HFNC. Whereas in the complications, there were lesser in the HFNC cohort, saying that there were lesser complications in the HFNC cohort, but the reincubation rate was higher in the HFNC cohort. Coming to the third analysis, which was published again in the International Journal of Chronic Obstructive and Pulmonary Diseases as early as 2023 May this year, it had 10 RCTs with a sample size of 1265, showing again no statistically significant difference in mortality, intubation, or length of stay in the hospital. But there was a higher crossover in the HFNC patients towards NIV, showing that NIV was slightly better. When it came to COVID patients, this is again a systematic review and meta analysis which was done in 2022, it showed that in the cohort of patients, there was slightly higher mortality in NIV patients, but the journal itself admits that there was very low quality of evidence on the grade evidence profile. And also the success rate was much higher in the NIV cohort. There was also one very important thing that I'd like to highlight that during COVID, there was a huge burden on the oxygen supply that was required. If you were to con compare NIV and HFNC, the amount of oxygen consumption by NIV itself is much, much lower, it's, which was a lifesaver for us during the first and second wave of COVID. Moving on to my last uh, meta-analysis or the last RCT, which is the most famous of NIV versus HFNC, also known as the Florali 2 trial, which was you know published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2019. It was an RCT with 322 patients. As you can see, there was no significant statistical difference in hypoxia, short-term complications, or long-term complications. But there was something which was very alarming in the results, which was that in the HFNC cohort, 35% of the patients had moderate or severe hypoxia, whereas in the NIV cohort, only 24% had severe hypoxia. But again, these results were not statistically significant. So at the end of this, my last stand is that NIV is like Rajnika. One superstar, five decades, 15 industry hits. Coming to the last one, which was released recently, which was Jailer. So a superstar will always be a superstar. I would like to thank the, the host for this humble opportunity for being able to present at this uh, dice and also I would like to end my talk with a take home message and a small gift for you all. The gift is the QR code. If you scan the QR code, you will get all of the literature that I have gone through and Dr. Puneet has gone through for our talks. And the take home message is that never treat the patient, always, always treat the pathology and that closure will help you do so. Thank you. temperature controlled you. 
we have only a three <coughs> settings to put it in the interface. So, how much to, how much size you have to select the uh, laser cannula is? It's just to cover 50% of laser cavity, just to maintain an effective pressure of your carbon dioxide. And this uh, HFNC laser prongs comes in three sizes. One is large, small, and medium. And for pediatric, it comes in a different millimeter size. And it is a small, soft, pliable prongs. So what are these three settings? One is temperature level set from 31 to 37 degrees Celsius. And the flow should range from 5 to 60 liter per minute, which you can progressively increase every uh, 5 to 10 liters if the patient has not improving with the HRNC deliver of flow range. And FIO2 can maintain from 21% to 100. You can maintain a uh, saturation <coughs> about 88 to 92 percent in a chronic patients. What are the mechanism of HRNC? What are the benefits of HRNC over NIV? The mechanism has both as high flow, heated and humidified, which is not normally you can give to the NIV. Heated and humidified, giving a high flow oxygen, your airway. Uh, uh, what you call, you can increase the mucociliary function of the airway and you can, uh, and you can, uh, what you call, uh, uh, clear the mucus secretions and also you can decrease the inflammation of the airway. And next thing is inspiratory demand. Suppose if any patient comes with a respiratory rate of 30 or 40, a tachypneic patients, their inspiratory demands will move. Their inspiratory flow demand can increase up to 30 liter per minute to 120 liter per minute. But with normal oxygen, conventional oxygen therapy, you cannot or you are unable to meet the in inspiratory flow demand. There comes the HFNC role, where you can give a high, uh, uh, high flow oxygen that will meet, not only meet, it will exceed the, the minute ventilation and in inspiratory flow demand of a patient. One more thing is, it also increases the FRC at least by 25% and while delivering a peak, how to generate a peak? It doesn't generate a peak like as you expect in NIV, but at least it will generate peak of 0.7 centimeter of water for every 10 liter of increment in the flow rate. Okay. And next one is your health lighter, which is more comfort, comfortable, tolerant. <coughs> By using HFNC in type 1 respiratory failure, the patient is able to talk, patient is able to vocalize, patient is able to eat, and you can clear their sputum secretions. But in NIV it is very difficult, in NIV it is claustrophobic and initially technically patient will be claustrophobic and they are more intolerant to the NIV. One more to, uh, advantage is oxygen dilution. Same thing I spoke about inspiratory flow demand. If you use uh, conventional oxygen therapy, if you provide 6 liter of oxygen to nasal prongs, approximately FIO2 is 45 percent. But it reaches a take care around closely around 21 percent because of oxygen dilution, but in HFNC, because of high flow, you can meet the possible of FIO2 around 45% uh, in the HFNC. One more is, uh, you can flush out the uh, nasopharyngeal airway, uh, airways, so that you can use the nasopharyngeal oxygen for gas exchange and alveolar recruitment and avoids rebreathing of carbon dioxide which is not usually happens in the NIV. What are the physiological benefits of HFNC or NIV? You can have a delivery fixed concentration of oxygen and other gases, which is more in HFNC than NIV. You can have an anatomic dead space washout more in HFNC than NIV. You have gas conditioning means we can humidify oxygen or gas you can give from HFNC than NIV. You have a mucociliary clearance which is more in HFNC than NIV. These are the physiological benefits of HFNC or NIV. What are the current clinical applications? I am not clear about indication of HFNC. We are just applying clinically the HFNC which is already proven in the acute hypoxic respiratory failure both in the normal and immunocompromised patients and also in the post expiration means that is prevention of reintegration. Means any patient who was distributed and you have to prevent from reintegration. This is also clinically applied. And ethnic and pre-oxygenation, which is an upcoming potential future for 
HRLC and EAE and you can use for palliative patients like DNR, DNI patients and also for respiratory procedures just by doing a bronchoscopy also you can just have a use HRLC while doing bronchoscopy. What are the future or present potentials of clinical application of HRLCs like means hypercapnic respiratory failure and cardiogenic pulmonary edema. If you have any patients with these symptoms or this diagnosis, you will definitely go for NIV. What are their HRNC benefits in the hypercapnic respiratory failure and in acute exacerbation of cardiogenic pulmonary edema? So, we have a lot of research, review, and evidence. So, what is the thing is saying as there is spoke glorially one trial where it is an RCT published in NHEM where it is compared HRNC versus conventional oxygen therapy versus NIV. The primary outcome are intubation at day 28. So fever, in, fever intubations in HRNC and day 28, ventilatory three days more in HRNC and lower 90 day mortality is more in HRNC. So in type 1 respiratory failure, always consider HRNC or NIV. Same thing with um, respiratory failure. There is a systemic analysis done by Shang and Zan uh, in China which is published in Review Care General 2017 where HFNC is associated with lower intubation rates in less <coughs> low baseline PAO2 and FIO2 ratio but HFNC and NIV both have similar or insignificant results in higher baseline of PAO2 ratio. Very alarming is uh, this is a study conducted in emergency department in US. Uh, it is published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. This is an RCT of patient uh, 204. There they included the patient of undifferentiated type 1 respiratory failure and the primary outcome was therapy failure at 72 hours. But HFNC at last what the end point is HFNC is non-inferior. Here they use as H. V1 means high velocity nasal insufflation that is can be given with small bores of HFNC nasal prongs. Usually we use higher bores in normal HFNC. Here they try it with smaller bores to give more pressure with the high flow. So one more indication is immunocompromise. This is a trial just published in the uh, Annals of Intensive Care 2016 which was an observational cohort with the, uh, the included patients of PO capital ratio less than 300 and uh, RR uh, work more than 25 uh, bits per minute. They compared HFNC versus NIV, primary outcome was mortality, day 28. You have lesser intubation rate with HFNC than NIV and lower mortality of day 28 with HFNC than NIV. One more uh, journal, uh, the article was published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Uh, this is a post of RCT just done in a French and Belgian 23 ICUs where they com compared HFNC versus NIV versus conventional oxygen therapy where the intubation rates are more in NIV than HFNC. So one, is, uh, one more potential uh, indication of clinical application of HFNC is that prevention of reintubation. Here the compared HFNC versus NIV, their primary outcome was uh, uh, any like uh, indication of Reintubation less than 72 hours. In HFNC, lesser respiratory failure overall in HFNC, but similar reintubation rates between HFNC and NIV over 72 hours. And they finally concluded that HFNC is non inferior to NIV. This is uh, an optinu tri uh, trial which is uh, for the clinical application of apneic and pre-oxygenation where they combined both HFNC and NIV versus NIV alone but HFNC plus NIV combination include oxygenation in pre-oxygenation patient versus NIV alone. So one more uh, journal uh, where the uh, study done in Japan emergency department which is published in BMC emergency medicine journal where they compared HFNC versus conventional oxygen therapy but they are not compared with NIV. But still, HFNC has median lowest of SPOT in the HFNC group. So, one more retrospective study in France, they compared pre oxygenation of HFNC versus NIV. The primary outcome was saturation less than 70. So, there was no episode of severe pre saturation in the HFNC group. So, here comes the, 
the future or potential indications of HFLC, where is the type 2 respiratory failure. This is a journal uh, which is uh, the, uh, this study is done in Greece here, where the RCT with the uh, patient number of 40, where they considered included a patient of PSEO to more than 45, even though the numbers are very small, HFNC 20 and NIV 20, but respiratory rate in HFNC was low in the NIV and PCO in the HFNC group was lower than the NIV group. HFNC was superior to NIV in the management of acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. This is very helpful for us being an emergency physician whether to start NIV or whether to start an HFNC in hypercapnic respiratory failure. This is also hypercapnic respiratory failure uh, study done in US emergency department. Say uh, it, uh, HFNC is similar to NIV and which is published in the Heartland Journal of Critical Care recently 2020. One more study which is published in Clinical Respiratory Journal where the HFNC versus NIV was compared. There was no difference between 30 day mortality and intubation rate with HFNC and NIV. So, can we use HFNC in cardiac Yes, there are uh, prospective and RCT studies. So, HFNC, by this study, you can conclude that HFNC uh, can reduce the PSEO2 value in one hour and increases the uh, respiratory rate and dyspnea in uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Here, one more study with uh, Stephen Haywood, it is uh, published in uh, Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2019. They compared HFNC versus NIV. The HFNC was non inferior to NIV. That, that's what their conclusion was. So, what are the recommendations according to 2022 guidance? Is there is strong recommendation for hypoxic respiratory failure and conditional recommendation for uh, for a extubation and conditional recommendation for post operative HFNC in obese or obese patient is cardiothoracic surgery. And there is no recommendation for peri intubation period. So, what the what does the European Respiratory uh, Society guidance says? They prefer HFNC over NIV in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and in hypercapnic failure they prefer NIV prior to the use of HFNC in the patient and it has conditional recommendation. What about uh, patients after extubation? NIV over HFNC for the patient at the risk of extubation failure. So, how do you measure HFNC assessment? Like we have a HACA score for NIV, same thing we have a ROX index for HFNC. So, by starting HFNC, you might get a AVG after 2 hours, but after 2 hours you might feel that PF ratio is improved, but the patient condition might be deteriorating. For that, they introduced a index for ROC index, which is uh, calculated by S. Uh, saturation uh, divided by FIO2 or divided by respiratory rate. If you use at uh, second hour or sixth hour or twelfth hour, if any score coming more than 4.48, then that means HFNC is effective and it is doing good. If any score comes less than 2.85 second hour, then HFNC failure less than 3.47 uh, is a failure in HFNC, less than 3.85 at 12 hours is a failure of HFNC. So, what are the future directions? The more insights are required for HFNC in adult year. Basically, HFNC are more studied in ICU settings and pediatric patients. But further, HFNC versus NIV uh, studies has to be done in the emergency department uh, relating to the mortality, ventilator free device, uh, days, and length of hospital stay and ICU stay. And more randomized studies should be included. Uh, apart from the acute respiratory hypoxemic respiratory failure. What are the take home messages? HFNC is a good scientific plausibility. Use, usefulness of HFNC is just as a high flow oxygen delivery in ICU area. Good robust evidence in the hypoxemic respiratory failure means Leno. <coughs> it is neither a substitute to NIV or nor substitute to mechanical ventilation. Underlying pathology and patient testing. So, these are the uh, recommendations, executive recommendations that HFNC is recommended 
ordinary further reading on. So, HFNC is like just Gil. He has just arrived to the cricketing world, but NIV is already a legend, you know, Virat Kohli. Both things we can we can compare with gold standard such in
not recommended because that itself can promote the classification of both calcium phosphate as well as xanthin causing further renal damage. So now that I will be told it, that you need to give fluid, next question you will ask me how much fluid, right? So uh, that is also a little bit like not, uh, has to be tailor-made for the patient but good hydration. If the patient is hypovolemic clinically, you have to hydrate till they achieve new volume. After they achieve new volume, you will have to give 2 to 3 liter per meter square daily which will usually come to 150 to 200 ml per hour and your target should be to get good urine output of at least 2 ml per kg per hour, right? So target your input output and your electrolytes. If the patient will give you so much fluids, not passing urine, you can use furosemide which will actually even help with excreting potassium and phosphate but be careful that you have to maintain the u volumic status, right? So that is the thing that you have to maintain u volumic. And also be wary that if there is no in not to patient responding to API, you don't want to push them into fluid overload. So then you'll have to become more cautious and judicious with your fluids. So that was the first thing. Second is RAS release. Now this drug has helped to manage human disease syndrome much better. And basically the fact is that this is we said that urine metabolism, hyperuricemia happens. Right? So in prophylaxis, we were targeting plasma oxidase allopurinol. But there is another drug called as rasburitase, which converts the uric acid into allopurinol, which is harmless. So that drug actually helps a lot to manage your hyperuricemia. Contraindicated in G6PD deficiency, and when you are giving it, be wary that it can sometimes cause anaphylaxis. Conventional dosing was 0 0.2 mg per kg daily, once a day for 5 days. But even a reduced dosing has found to really help patients with hyperuricemia. One more uh, thing that they say is that some experts say that uh, if you are giving rasmurities, along with that if you are giving allopurinol, it might actually be counterproductive because you are not allowing the uric acid to form for the rasmurities to act. So if you are anyway giving rasmurities, you need not give allopurinol or tenoxostat. Why we don't always give rasmurities? Because of the cost constraints. Because it's a very expensive drug. So that's why if we don't have this, you can still go for your allopurinol or Right? Next would be correcting electrolytes. So potassium, avoid giving excess potassium or phosphate. Phosphate binders should be used and manage hyperkalemia. Okay? Now one question I'll, I'll put forward. We said that there is going to be hypocalcemia. Now the patient doesn't have symptoms of hypocalcemia, but you saw that the lab calcium was low. Would you treat it? How many say yes? So how many say no? Why no? Yes. Yes, the primary pathology here is actually the high phosphate which is binding and causing calcium phosphate which is reducing the calcium. So you adding calcium to this will not really help. But if the patient is having, this also asymptomatic. But if there is a symptomatic life threatening hypocalcemia, then you give calcium at the lowest dose that possible. Okay? And these patients are also people who probably, this happening because of very high phosphate level. Na? So early dialysis in these patients also might be something which we can consider. Which comes to our final slide about human life, that is hemodialysis. Low threshold because hemodialysis will correct a lot of the electrolyte abnormalities. So patients who have fluid overload because you can't hydrate them anymore or who have uric acid severely high even after you gave them rasburitase or marked hyperphosphatemia or high calcium phosphate products, symptomatic hypocalcemia, uncontrolled hyperkalemia even after your correction or the regular other indications like uremia acidosis or in urea you can consider hemodialysis. So that was about the tumor disease syndrome. Treatment includes hydration, rasmurities, electrolyte correction, mainly consider early dialysis if things are not improving. Right? Let's go to the next case. Okay? So you have seen that patient. A 40 year old male, um, male patient came. Progressive dyspnea on exertion since 2 weeks, dry cough, decreased appetite, and he has patient at next well. He looks like this. I'm not sure if the thing is clear, but although 
include babies, right? Management. In here, every might need to be secured. If they are having lot of strider or military animal, you have to secure the area. And if they have hemodynamic instability, then we have to also tackle that. And definitely would be we need to expeditely find the cause and treat it. Yes. 
Come in between.
dean and director of that institute principal and also headed by uh, hod of that department usually it contains 15 marks of the interview out of which five marks is for personality where they will ask you regarding uh, emergency or what are your plans how do you develop a department those things other 10 marks already you could have achieved before coming into the actual interview that is publications for publications you will have four marks 0.5 marks for each paper so maximum eight papers fetching four marks second thing teaching experience and in this publication one clause is there either you have to be the first author or the corresponding author the what recent tendency guidance where you have seen the first three authors as well as the corresponding author that won't apply for this because in the recent interviews where some of you attended uh, in government medical colleges so second author and third author is not considered that is con uh, first three authors plus uh, corresponding author is considered for promotion but not for interview so please make a note of it second thing is teaching experience every year and for example if you are appearing for an assistant professor if you already have two years of assistant professor experience each year you will get 0.5 marks so one marks you will get for two years like that maximum you can have six years of experience three marks next is gold medal if you have a gold medal in that particular subject you will get two marks and if you have any procedures uh, any medications or any patent on your name you will get one mark so totally 15 and it follows the roster system so some of our friends who have attended the government medical college interviews have not been selected because see what happens we think that there is only one post if called for an assistant professor or associate professor a uh, few of our friends have appeared one post and one application what happens in private medical colleges we think that okay one post is there i have attended i will get the appointment it is not so in government because in government when they call for an interview they will call for assistant professors of all departments for example anatomy 2 post uh, medicine 3 emergency 1 like that you will be competing for one post along with other departments for example if 10 assistant professor posts are called for an interview across all departments the uh, person who has got highest marks among all 10 irrespective of the departments they will see whether he fits into any particular department like that it goes it doesn't mean that if you get uh, uh, one post one person has attended it is not sure that you will get it because it follows a, a roster system what is this roster system as per the constitution of india this roster system has been formed for example based on the reservations they will have for example a particular uh, reservation particular category 0 0.1 0 0.2 3 4 like that they have 100 points first they will fill up point one so you can still you can beat all these reservation points and you can get into government system only possible thing is what i told in the previous slides if you have good publications and teaching experience gold medal still you can beat other people and other department people uh, and also you have got vertical reservation and horizontal reservation that we will not discuss at this point of time and it has got merit merit based they will announce in the same day itself what are the uh, marks that you have got. The selection process is very tedious. So the selection process starts with notification. For example, one month or uh, 15 days before the notification, before the actual interview, they will put the notification for which they will invite application. And after you apply with all uh, proper credentials, they will call for an interview, walk-in interview. On the same day of the interview, they will uh, publish provisional merit list. When provisional merit list has been published the same day, you can put objections if you have any queries or you can go to court. If everything is satisfied, if anybody has got uh, any objections, that will be cleared by the selection committee, then it goes to final merit list. Once you get final merit list, again you will have an option of asking for clarifications why you have not been selected or if you have been selected other candidate can ask reasons why you have selected that candidate why not me like that there will be so many processes once final merit list has been crossed then they will go for provisional selection list provisional selection list will go for approval from the government it will go to final selection list after final selection list you will get an appointment letter after within 15 days of the appointment letter you need to report or else appointment will be cancelled 
So earliest is three months. What I have seen in the recent years, uh, applying for and uh, getting an appointment, and maximum is two uh, two years. Where I attended the interview in 2021, and I got this permanent post in early 2023. And we'll talk about uh, pros and cons of uh, government medical colleges, especially in emergency medicine and also private medical colleges. When it comes to government medical colleges, the process is treating patients at free of cost. That's the best experience you will get and you will be more satisfied. And comparatively, patients are very respectful. They will be like, you know, they will be like, you know, they will be like, you know, they will be like, we will be seeing you as God. That kind of feeling you will have that is more satisfying. And you will have a better opportunity, as I earlier said, if you are going to the policy making. Because during policy making, government people look at the people who are in government medical colleges first. If you don't have anyone in the government medical colleges, then they rarely go for private sector. Then you will have minimal time for counseling. Uh, compared to private uh, sector, where you will have to explain regarding the cause, all those things. In government medical colleges, just one thing, either you should have BPL card, other card, anyone is suffice or you should have Aishman Bharat card. If you have that, that also you need not produce at the time of admission, you will have 24 to 48 hours to produce that, or else everything will be free of cost. And compared to private sector, I say government has got better payment because, for, an exam, for example, uh, four years of AP, and after four years of AP, you can become associate. In private sector, what happens if the post is not vacant, you will not be promoted. In government, what will happen, even if there is no post, they will, sub, will give promotion, something called time-bound promotion. Your designation will still stay as, uh, stay as assistant professor, but you will get all the perks like uh, uh, salary hike, TAD, everything will be at par with the associate professor. And you can become guide everything, except only for designation, you will get all monetary benefits. And we have got high demands, but uh, Due to selection process, we are not getting into the government uh, sector. And lack of super speciality, it's a, it can be either a pros as well as cons. Lack of super speciality services, for example, in my college, we don't have any super speciality. For example, cardiology, we don't have. So, in these three years, we have traumatized around uh, more than 300 to 350 patients. So, most of the uh, emergencies were requiring super speciality can be done at our level itself, can be stabilized and later be sent. And you will have more clinical material. And the cause is, you will have, because it's a low resource setting, for example, if a patient comes in uh, breathlessness, fetal edema, all those things, have cardiac failure, you will not have echo also, you will not have anti pro BNP, all those things. And if you send investigations now, at least the earliest is 6 to 8 hours you can expect. ABG, all those things, if you have ABG at uh, one, 1 month, Reagents will get over, second month, third month you will not have, you need to call for a tender. I guess it's a tedious process and there won't be continuous supply of drugs and consumables. That is uh, uh, one of the cons and always you will have understaffed. Where I work is a 35 bedded emergency. So we have around uh, 2 to 3 staffs per shift. So around uh, eight, 9 to 10 staffs into 24 hours we need to manage. And lack of super speciality, for example, trauma requiring intervention immediately will not be possible where which requires a OT intervention. In such cases, it is difficult to manage. And as I already told, it's a tedious process for job recruitment. Whereas in case of private medical colleges, to establish a department, it's an easy process of paperwork to set a department. You can easily recruit the faculty from other department and start emergency medicine, but in private, it is not possible because everything in private uh, at the rank of assistant professor level everything has to go to an IAS officer for permission. So this file to move from one table to one table it takes weeks and months sometimes years. So and uh, less cost to build a department. You can request other department people or you can buy some space. In government it is not possible. For everything, again, they will have an engineering section, they have to come and approve. Even to get a bulk, you need to quote for a tender, all those things will be there. You cannot just go give your money and buy and put, that is not possible. And cons are convincing the administrative authorities regarding procuring equipment, they will ask, will you put everything 
to use at once, for example, ventilators, ultrasound machines, will you be able to generate the amount of money that has been invested? Will that be possible? That's a question revenue making. So with this all background, what we have done from our end and with the help of all our senior colleagues and faculties, what is done so far from our institute is that is ABRK course, that is Ayushman Bharat Aruge Karnataka course. After struggle of two years, we got special permission for our institute where we can treat all what are the emergencies that a physician can treat that we got in October 2021. Only our institute had that. Then uh, in 2022 February, the director of medical education asked all the government medical colleges to set up a department and send the requirements. Unfortunately, except our institute, that is Chamanagar Institute of Medical Sciences, including BMC, MMC, they didn't submit. I still have the letter where they have uh, written that uh, you need to answer back with the proposed protocol within 24 hours, treat this mail as emergency. So even after many months, none of the institute responded. So we submitted on the floor plan, consumables, expenditure, equipment list, how much salary will be required, cost, everything. So the purchase comes around 15 crores, starting from the site where you build everything and to full fledged and to run emergency department at the government rate. And 50 bedded new emergency under PM Abhi, that's a scheme from central government they have started. After this COVID, uh, they want to manage, uh, they want to have a small nursing home like thing within the hospital for example any isolation like these kind of infectious cases comes without disturbing other normal structure so we are the first institute in Chandranagar to get uh, among government institutes in Karnataka to get this block it is under construction probably in another six months they will hand over this to us and when we uh, most of the institutes uh, starting from 2018 many institutes like SSIMS, JJM and also St. John's from 2018-2019, they have written many letters to the government regarding AVRK codes to make it available to treat and admit patients free of cost. So that was not possible because we didn't have anyone to represent at the state level. Every All other departments have their own committee. For example, general medicine, three, four senior professors, they have, they have made a committee. Anything that requires uh, any intervention or to deciding what course which has to, for example, hemothorax, should it go under respiratory medicine or general medicine. So they will take a decision, that expert committee. Unfortunately, that was not formed till now. But in July 2023, that is two months back, it was formed, uh, put in subcommittee where Dr. Girish Narayan sir from St. John's, Dr. Madhu Srinivasanam from JSS and Dr. Mahesh from Institute of Gastroenterology and transplant unit and myself are the four committee members for this and uh, these three people helped us a lot in convincing the government regarding uh, uh, AVR reports made available for us. Finally in August that is uh, last month we got around 40 to 42 codes for emergency medicine. Now if you register your name under AVRK portal with your degree DNB or emergency medicine and all those 14 codes will be available for us. So what is the future? So this is done so far, there are so many things to be done for which reinstating emergency medicine in the undergraduate uh, curriculum, that is the main thing. And PCP and DFT Act, that uh, all emergency physicians should get this registration without any hassle. Uh, right now we have only medicine, surgery, few codes where they can also have I utilize the codes we can also utilize that is they have given cross speciality but uh, unlike other departments we should also have this kind of separate codes for emergency that has to be done uh, under AVRK and HSVD and establishing emergency medicine department at all medical colleges after recent NMC guidelines most of the colleges have dropped out starting emergency medicine and uh, when we started emergency medicine in government medical college the first requirement they asked is MCA at that time, MCA was there, MCA permits this or not. Now without that guidance, it will be difficult at undergraduate level to start. Then starting emergency residency program at all medical colleges. Few days back uh, when we had uh, senior colleagues and mentors gave an idea that uh, today's uh, when chief guest uh, 
Mr. Dinesh Gundra had come, we discussed with him strengthening emergency medicine at Taluk and government hospitals. The idea is to start a DNB uh, emergency medicine compared to MD, uh, starting DNB emergency medicine would be little easier. So we have a plan of discussing all these things with the government and starting uh, DNB emergency medicine at all the district hospitals in coming years. All these things can be possible because of the answer is in the last point that is registered state body that is to have an association of emergency physicians of Karnataka. This was when I made this slide one month back that was not possible. Recently this week we have, I am very happy and uh, excited to announce that we have already registered and we are the first state in India to register association will uh, fight and work towards achieving all these things with all your help and in another one or two weeks we will start the membership drive also the details will be shared in future in another two one or two weeks and henceforth the state conferences will be conducted under the banner of this association thank you <laughs> First of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Vijay for all the effort he is taking, placing himself in a rural setup and that too at the government level and uh, getting the things done. I think we have a special quality in getting the things done. So I expect all of you to be a big was uh, started somewhere in 1970 and they called it as the golden era. So only in India, last two, three years is the golden era. Though the specialty was done in few of the institutions like SRMC and uh, probably here St. John's and uh, maybe Upper Group where the Prasad and all. Even without NMC this one, they were running the emergency medicine. But emergency medicine specialty got recognized as uh, this one was uh, probably in uh, somewhere 2006 or something like that, as a specialty. Then uh, they made the rule and last two years, they said that two, three years, it, is, it should be there in every medical college. That really gave the impetus to start the specialty in almost all over India. It has been started. But in the recent, uh, this one, it, uh, they are telling that it is obligatory, not confirmed or uh, mandatory to in every for these studies. So now it is a retrograde stop. Even in the US when I was seeing, they also had the same problem. Anesthesia as this emergency medicine at the crossroads, under what they called actually. So, but definitely the specialty has really made a difference. What you are seeing, the postgraduate numbers have increased with this. So it may be a small temporary transit phase, definitely specialty will come in, uh, and uh, the specialty has already established, public are aware about that. And what difference it can make in the emergency room, what we are seeing, I feel at least uh, everybody, those who are in the position, like the political leaders, they should fall sick and when they should go realize or go to the hospital. When their kitten can go there, and there they see what is being done, then they will realize. Until that time, they won't realize the problem, how it makes a difference in the saving the lives, particularly with the trauma, which is increasing day to day, as well as the acute coronary condition, like for example, earlier it was at the age and all, nowadays only then people are getting this. We saw the bullying at that age. So when it happens, how there was a big, huge cry, how it is affecting young people. So awareness is increasing. I feel this only a transit phase. Definitely we are going to have this. And now more postgraduates have come. The way the state conferences, national conferences recently, uh, 
all these things, you know, definitely we are going in a positive way. Now I tell uh, Dr. Deepak Kamsa to talk to you.
Tamil Nadu has started DMV emergency medicine programs across the state in every government hospital. And they've also got a big code for trauma, 48 hours completely covered. And uh, this has happened automatically because their state government moved towards that. I think we will have to, the association that many, many of us have joined together to form, the idea is to push this agenda in our state. Not only just for recognition for us, but also to make a difference with the patient. So I think we need to learn from other states and move forward in that direction. Because I think they've taken a lot of steps that we haven't. So that's one thing to learn from. If we can meet the, the minister again, so we can highlight these things. And if anybody has any connects and all, that's what we need to move forward. With. Talking here is enough. But, you know, connecting with people and bringing more people into the association, joining, talking to each other and getting ideas. We met some people from Tamil Nadu, they told us. That's how these ideas will come out. So we need to move forward working together. I think that's the important thing. Once again, congratulations and Father, good talk and good efforts. And I can assure on behalf of all of us, we are with you and we will definitely move forward. Thank you. Throughout the day, about emergency medicine being a very young and upcoming branch, we have also seen that, in spite of it being the bedrock of a hospital, there is a senior dearth. Uh, there is a serious dearth of emergency care positions in our healthcare setup. This talk has been greatly helpful in enunciating the same and has highlighted the various challenges in establishing the department from scratch. And it is okay, a matter of great pride that our Karnataka is the first and the only state in India <coughs> to have an association of emergency um, uh, emergency physicians. Uh, and uh, it was called Karnataka Emergency Physicians and uh, Emergency Physician Association. And it is definitely a matter of great pride for us. So we thank our speaker and the moderators for this event today and uh, I request the moderators to kindly felicitate uh, uh, Dr. Abhishek Kedi sir who was the speaker for the session. May we have a huge round of applause.